Welcome to Shraf's technical series. In today's session, we're going to discuss Boost Beast based REST API server. In the previous sessions, we have discussed the Boost Beast based um, various uh, programs, Ready Streams, WebSockets, WebSocket Server, etc. So, this is continuation of those video sessions. In today's video session, we will update the code base to implement REST API server. So the REST API server will parse the request from the web browser and then prepares a response and sends it back. So first, the demo. I have the WebSocket server running here in the background. So yeah, the web server is running in the background and serving the requests. So when I send the uh, HTTP requests using curl for now. So for example, this is a get request. So this may, this is the request method get and then we get the response from the server. So for today's demo, we will just uh, send back a text with the verb that we are sending to the server. In the subsequent uh, session, we will enhance this one to support um, JSON output. So we send a post. So this request method, post. Similarly, we send uh, put. So this is the request method, put. And then we send a delete request. So this is request method, delete. So that is the response we get from the REST API server. As I mentioned, we will enhance this in future videos so we get a proper, well-formatted JSON output. But for this session, we just wanted to show that the web server receives the request and sends us, sends us back the response for the correct verb. So we'll go through the code base, the changes we have made. First, the main.cpp. In the main.cpp, we just uh, added some boost-based logs. Earlier, we had the C out, console out uh, statements. We removed them and uh, we are using boost trivial logging now. So that is the change that was made in the uh, main server, uh, the main.cpp. And if you recall from the boost program options video, uh, video previous to this one, we have updated the main.cpp to call sub programs based on the input the user provides. For example, in uh, to run the web server, to run the web server, I have provided the web server option minus s web server. So because of that, when the in the switch case, when the web server is called, we call the web server function. And the web server function will call the uh, web server.cpp class file. So we'll go back to the git graph. So next, the web server.cpp. In the web server.cpp, we added a new IO context. So we'll go through the thread model first. So in the previous sessions we discussed, we had three IO contexts. Now we added a fourth IO context called IO context underscore background. And the IO context background processes HTTP request and prepares the response. The response is prepared, the foreground threads or the IO context would get the request, sends it to the IO context background. The request is processed and a response object is created. And that response object is sent back to IO context, and the IO context will send the response to the browser. So the IO context can be called as a foreground or front front end thread, which um, interacts with the uh, web, web browser and the IO context background will do the long running work. So this way, when we separate these into separate IO contexts, 
If there is a request which takes too long, for example, database calls, then the background would be busy and the foreground threads like IO context is still free to uh, get more, uh, process more requests from the users. So that's why we had to segregate them into separate IO contexts. And then the IO context background is in the shade state. So the it's put in the shade state. So in future, if if there's anything needs to be done in the background, through shade state, we can get a handler, get a reference to the IO context background uh, object. And that's how it can be shared across the whole program. So we'll switch back to the code. So this is the web server.cpp. As I mentioned, I added the IO context background worker to the web server.cpp. Then I create an empty work, make work guard, and then I send the IO, con IO context background worker to the, the work guard to that IO context background worker so so the work is submitted to the IO context background so this is an empty work and because of that empty work the IO context background will wait and would not exit immediately because if you create an IO context and do not provide any work to it it will exit immediately in the other IO context we created, if you remember, for example, the listener IO context would listen to the incoming HTTP requests. It's a long running. So once you start the IO context by calling IO context.run, it, it will be blocked there. The subscriber would block at uh, subscription to the Redis. The publisher would block at the single producer, single consumer queue we created, waiting for the messages from the Redis subscriber. So all these three from line 56 to 58 IO context have some long running task already assigned to them. But the background worker IO context has no long running task assigned to it. It, it will wait until a task is assigned to it. So, so to when we instantiate the IO context, we have to just give an empty work and that's why we give a work guard so that it will wait until work is assigned to it. And then in the rest of the programs, we on signal, on signal, we stop the IO context. Then we assign some threads to the IO context, threads to the IO context, and then uh, we add it to the, th we provide the threads to the IO context and then we join. So that is all from the same previous session. So we can skip over to the next uh, file, HTTP sessions dot. So yeah, that is the web server. Now in shade state dot CPP, Yeah, the system is slow. The sheet start CPP. Okay, let me close up these windows. In the shade state dot CPP, we pro we added a reference to the web server. So that. So using that reference, yeah. in the shade state.cpp, we added the IO context background worker as one of the parameters to the constructor. And then we also added a reference to the IO context background underscore worker. So this way, any any other component in the program can access the IO context background and assign work to it. So we'll close out this file and go back to Git graph.
नेक्स्ट दी एच टी पी सेशन एच टी टी पी सेशन डॉट सी पी पी इन दी एच टी टी पी सेशन डॉट सी पी पी इफ यू रिकॉल दी दिस इज द इनिशियल द लिसनर वन इट रिसीव कनेक्शन ऑन दिस सॉकेट इट विल इंस्टेंशिएट एन एच टी टी पी सेशन एंड वंस द एच टी टी पी सेशन इज इंस्टेंशिएटेड दैट इज अ हैंड शेक इन प्रोग्रेस and at the handshake level it would know whether it is a web socket connection or a plain http connection if it is the web socket connection it will send the response to the web socket session dot cpp class which we discussed in the boost beast web socket server uh, session so today we will focus on the http session dot cpp class dot tv so we have so we'll go from top to bottom to read okay so on read so if you recall the http the listener.cpp would get a connection on the web socket then on we do on read on that uh, web socket and on read of the web socket the first thing we'll do is um, validate jwt token which we discussed in a previous session we get the http body and we send it to validate http token and if the token is uh, invalid we send user unauthorized if it is valid we let the process flow through so if you look at the curl command i sent i was sending the api token here in the query parameters in the next session we will convert this to accept uh, http headers where the bearer token will be embedded into the http headers but for now in this video session we'll just leave it in the query parameters and once the invalidate jwt token we parse the we parse the query parameters then verify that the token is valid if it is valid we'll flow through and at line 379 i also mentioned in the previous videos we'll check if it is a web socket connection if it is a web socket connection we will send the we'll hand over the request to the web socket session class or object and then we return from http session dot cpp if it is not a web socket request then http session dot cpp will parse the request so to do that uh, the original code had the handle request we converted the handle request to send an optional of message generator so we pass to the handle request the document root where all the web server files are and then we release the parser so once we release the parser the handle request will get the r value reference of the request object so we'll go to handle request class so which is on the top yeah since it's in the diff mode i cannot uh, go to that um, function directly so i'll just scroll over to handle request okay so this is the handle request and then you have uh, two ampersands that means it's an r value reference and you did a parser dot release so you get the r r value reference to the request object and then we updated this handle request to send an optional of message generator 
before it was http message generator we updated that to send an option of message generator we'll see why we needed an optional so the rest of the code is same it all it it has some uh, lambdas to send us um, various responses for example this one is uh, bad request response not found response these are all lambdas serve error then we come here so we make sure we handle the we make sure we can handle the method so if it is If the request method is not is equal to get and not equal to head, if it's not both of them, then we send an unknown HTTP method. If it is both of them, or we go through the rest of the file. So the commented out code it sends us the it sends the files directly. So we commented that out because. In Shrav's case, we don't send the files from the web server. We we send a reference to the AWS uh, file in the AWS S3 bucket. So we send a signed um, a signed request URL to the AWS endpoint. So we don't want to serve the files over the web server. So that's why we commented that out. If you have to serve files, you can uncom uncomment out those lines. So now we we get the we are here so we get the target the path we are requesting and then we create a response if it's the head method we created a head response at line 228 if it is a head response we send the head response. So that is what the head at line 228. It's just a lambda. It sends the head response. Now, if it is a, any request other than those, for example, in our case, we were sending, uh, if you see here, we sent delete, post, put, del yeah, we send one more delete. So any of these requests, if it is any of those requests, we do boost asynchronous IO post to the IO context background worker. We get the executor from the state. We discussed previously where in the state we added a reference to the IO context background worker. So we get uh, to that executor to IO context background. We send this HTTP session, which is shared from this. Shared from this will return a shared pointer to the session. And then, and then it will also get, move the request, move the request object to the lambda. So in here, we get the, we parse payload, we just take the response, parse payload, we're not doing anything much there, we just get the text, which you saw here, this text, just returns that text. And then using that I context response, it will send it back to. So it prepares the payload. Then we do net is nothing but reference to boost ASIO namespace, boost ASIO post, boost ASIO post from the session, the session which we passed here. From the session, it gets the from the session, it gets the underlying TCP socket. For the underlying TCP socket, we get the executor. For the executor, which is bound to that socket, on that executor, we send the HTTP response. So we do a bind 
end. So we take the session pointer. On the session pointer, we get a reference to the do write function. And to the do write, we send the response object which we created here. So we are doing context switch from we we were initially on the get executor of the socket at line 256. Then we send the request to the background worker. The background worker processes the request and prepares a response. And the background worker will send back the response object to the to the uh, TCP socket based executor. So we switched context for back and forth. Also at line 265 right now we are referencing the session directly. So here we have to add uh, a check to see if the session is still a valid pointer because if the session has been deallocated we cannot do reference to this pointer here. So we'll add the check later at to line 265. So that's how we send the do write. So we'll go to the do write function. Okay, so the do write function, the background worker sends the response which is a reference to the response. Then we generate the, then we have to create a message generator and stood move the response. Message generator expects an R value reference. So we have to stood move the response. And then we pass the message generator to the beast async write. And we have to move the generator because the async write expects an R value reference. Also, we cannot pass the response directly to the async write it has to be a message generator because it is a delayed operation so when the async write happens asynchronously it will create uh, it will parse the response and uh, sends it over the socket so we cannot pass the response directly at line 394 we had to pass the message generator and then we pass the stood move the generator then the async write, um, asynchronous write, the thread whenever it is available, it will do an asynchronous write and then it will write on the socket. So that's how we write back to the socket. Also, if you remember, in one of the sessions, we discussed that uh, when the WebSocket connection is received, Boost creates a strand and then sends pro and then on that st strand, the WebSocket operations are done. So that way, Boost ASIO ensures that whenever that WebSocket is accessed on a strand, a single thread will access it at a time. So that's ASIO's way, asynchronous IO's way of ensuring that any shared state is always accessed by a single thread at a time. So we made that strand when we received the connection from the listener. So since initially we made a strand, when we call, when we call uh, do write on the WebSocket from the background thread, since the the socket is already on a strand when we send the response from the background thread to the uh, web socket it is still ensured that that strand is honored and then you know there's no uh, there's no uh, access of that uh, shared state that socket by multiple threads because that socket is already uh, on a single strand so with that uh, i conclude this session in the next session since we have the verbs being served by the web server, we will do database calls to the MongoDB and then send the valid JSON back to the browser in a CRUD fashion, create, uh, request, update, delete. We'll handle those calls to the MongoDB server. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please uh, uh, ping, ping me or reach us in the discussion discussion section thank you